In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Je Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot to enter the sanctuary. Well, Zechariah was in the sanctuary, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will, ha will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Restore Online. My name is Troy McMahon. I get the privilege to be the lead pastor here at Restore. And I just gotta say, I absolutely, absolutely love our digital pastor, Theo Davis. It has been such a joy for he and I to work so closely together over the last four years. And I love that we get to partner together into the Jesus mission. Hey, I just wanna say, we are full on into the Christmas season. So I wanna just take a temperature reading. So if you would just kind of Go along with me and be honest. Would you say that you are more of a Christmas lover or a Christmas struggler? You know, lover or struggler? I gotta be honest with you, I got both in my family. I got Christmas lovers and I got Christmas strugglers. Wherever you happen to find yourself on that spectrum, I'm just glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're spending time with us. I'm glad that you're leaning in. Now, now, one of the great parts of Christmas is the idea and the joy that comes in the giving or the receiving of presents, right? That just right present that you want to receive from someone, or that just right present that you want to give to someone. And it could be a child, it might be a sibling, a friend, it might be your parents, a spouse, a neighbor, or coworker. But if there is a just right present, then, well, there's kind of got to be a wrong present, so, real quick, think about this. What's the worst present you ever got? Worst present. Hey, if you happen to be watching this with someone, go ahead, share it with them. If you're watching it by yourself, just take a moment, chat, like, throw in the chat your, your worst present you've ever had. Well, for me, my worst present ever was a pair of mittens from my great-grandmother. Now, you might be thinking, wow, Troy, if your worst present was ever mittens, that's a pretty easy life. Yeah, i got to be honest with you. I got a brand new, personally mitted pair of mittens, knitted pair of mittens every year. And it was great when you're five. But when you get those mittens when you're 12, I mean, you put those on to kind of demonstrate and model for grandma, but those things never see your hand again. Now... There is a disappointment uh, of getting a Christmas present that's wrong, and that's typically short-lived. But all of us, well, we typically have many more experiences in our lives that are much greater disappointment. And I'm talking about real struggles, unfulfilled dreams, dashed hopes. And Christmas tends to be the season, right, where we all want to be Christmas lovers, right? And we all want to only focus on all the great things that matter to us. But the reality is, it's also the season where it mixes in with the joy, a lot of pain. Perhaps the pain that you are experiencing right now comes from personal disappointments, right? We've all had hopes for our families, right? But right now we're grieving the loss, the loss of a loved one who's passed on or died over this last year. Or we're grieving the loss of a relationship, a friendship, a marriage that's just dissolved through our hands. We had, we had hopes for our careers, right? But right now, man, our job just seems like a grind. Or we're longing to even find a job and it's leaving us hopeless. Or we had hopes for financial security and the, the crisis that's all around us, man, it just feels overwhelming and the bills are piling up and the foreclosure notices are showing up. Or we had hopes for health. And the doctor's news, the report, 
It's not what you wanted to hear. So maybe you've got personal pain, personal disappointments. Or maybe your pain that you're experiencing comes from cultural disappointments, right? I mean, the past two years has just been absolutely full of cultural disappointments, right? COVID, racial issues, political strife, financial challenges. I mean, what's going on? What do I do? How should I respond? I mean, those are questions that ring in my head every single day. So yes, Christmas is this time of joy and love and peace. But it's also this time where, man, we face disappointments. Personal disappointments. Cultural disappointments. Well, today we're starting a brand new series. And over the next few weeks, our desire is that for you and I, for all of us together, to be able to see something new and different through the Christmas story. And that's to discover that hope for everyone is possible. So we're going to start this series and we're going to look at two people. Two people who are living in a time of great cultural disappointment. And at the same time, they were wrestling and struggling through their own personal disappointment. So we meet Zachariah and Elizabeth. And we meet them in the first chapter of the book of Luke. That's one of the Gospels. Those are the first four books in the New Testament, the biblical narrative of Jesus' life. And, and Luke is the third, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So in Luke chapter one, we discover these first two major characters in the Christmas story. Now the kids, they did a great job of sharing this story with us just a few minutes ago. But I want us to dive in a little deeper. So here's what we read in Luke chapter one. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division as Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Now, a couple things are going on here. Right there at the beginning, it talks about this time of King Herod. I mean, this is the first century Palestine, first century Israel, and it is a very disappointing time culturally. I mean, Rome's in power, and they're taxing everybody oppressively. But in addition to Rome, they have this kind of puppet king known as Herod, and he is ruthless. So culturally, it is difficult. You thought 2021 is bad. I'm telling you, 0001 is worse but it's not just cultural. When, when it says they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, I mean, that has far, far reaching implications for them personally, but also within their culture. You know, I've had many friends who've really struggled with infertility, struggle with being able to have and conceive a child. And it's one of the most painful things that I've watched my friends walk through. So I just want to say, if you are someone who has struggled with infertility, my guess is that you hear those words written by Luke and you can feel the deep, deep pain of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But in addition to their own sense of unfulfilled longing, I mean, their childlessness within that culture was also a source of shame. Later in the chapter, Elizabeth would refer to her inability to have a child as a disgrace. You see, in ancient Jewish culture, a childless woman was viewed kind of as a cursed woman. So on top of her pain of not being able to have a fulfilled dream of having a child, she's carrying this condemnation of people thinking that the fact that she can't have a child is because of her sin. And she has borne this shame into old age. Yet when we look at what Luke writes, here's what he says about Elizabeth and Zechariah. He says, they are righteous in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Do you realize what this means? It, it shows us that sometimes good, righteous people, they have 
difficult, deep, painful disappointments in their lives. Have you ever felt like you're being punished for something that happened in your life? Have you wondered if things just might be different or better, if you were a better person or if you were a better Christian? Sometimes we get in our head that, you know, bad things only happen to bad people and they don't happen to good people. But in Zachariah and Elizabeth's story, we discover that's just not true. Here we have two good, faithful people and they're facing some painful, disappointing circumstances. Well, Luke continues. We read that once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as priest before God. And he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. Let me give you a little context here. So by lineage, Zechariah is a member of the priesthood. So he's kind of the elected, selected, paid God guy. And he would have been one of nearly 18,000 priests at the time. Now, a priest would get the privilege only one time in their lifetime to officiate at the altar in the temple. And this was determined, well, by lots, by a lottery of sort. And so you have to imagine with 18,000 priests, well, Zachariah's chances of getting selected... They're just not that good. In fact, I have to wonder how many times when they would gather together and they would cast lots, somebody else would be picked. Time after time, year after year, Zechariah lines up thinking it might be him, and it's not. And now we find him as this old man. And I'm wondering at this age, was he even thinking that his number would ever come up? Or had he completely resigned himself that it's probably not going to happen? Well, I share all this with you because I just want us to understand that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they've been waiting and waiting a long, long time for what they'd hoped for. And they'd experienced disappointment again and again and again. Yet in the midst of their disappointment, they still remain faithful they still continue to follow God's laws and commands. And they don't grow bitter. And as we're getting ready to to look at what happens in their lives, the first thing that we have to understand about hope is that sometimes hope says wait. When you and I, when we're face to face with our disappointments, all of the longings that we have that remain unfulfilled when it seems like that we've been forgotten, that's when we have to understand that hope says, wait. Because it's never, never too late for hope to enter into the story. So Zechariah enters the temple to light the incense on the altar. And then suddenly, Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, shows up and interrupts the ceremony. And Luke, I love how Luke writes this, He says that Zechariah is startled and gripped with fear. You think? I mean, you're there by yourself. This is not the expectation of the day. But the angel doesn't just appear, begins to speak to him. And here's what it says. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. Now, I have to imagine that Zachariah at his age is going like, wow, those are prayers from long ago. After all, he and Elizabeth are very old at this point in time, and he has probably completely given up on the possibility of her ever getting pregnant. And he's got to be thinking, as soon as he hears it, oh, no, 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 I am not going to let Elizabeth know. I am not going to get her hopes up again. She has been so many times disappointed, and it's too painful But Gabriel gets even more specific, kind of like it's a done deal. Here's what he says. Okay, your wife's getting pregnant. You are to call him John, and he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And it's interesting, Gabriel then would tie John, this child to be born to this Old Testament prophecy that says that he would be the one who would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. 
And he would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow, Zechariah's trying to take all this in, and he's in this state of shock. But, but he needs some reassurance. So he, he looks at Gabriel, he says, how can I be sure of this? I, I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years. Translation, what you talking about, Gabriel? I have no way to see that this is possible. But the angel's response to Zechariah the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now, don't you wish you kind of would have been a fly on the wall when Gabriel responded to Zechariah? You wonder what the tone of his voice was. Was Gabriel just kind of matter of fact? Or was he a little bit ticked off at Zach because he was kind of like, hey, believe me when I tell you things. A modern translation might have been, look, dude, you don't understand who you're talking to. I am Gabriel. I have come straight from God to talk to you. Whatever Gabriel's tone happened to be, here's his response to Zechariah's doubt. He informs him that, Zach, you will be silent and not able to speak until this, speaking of John's birth, until this happens. Because you did not believe my words. You see, Zechariah, he needed a reminder. A reminder that when you come face to face with God, the God that you worship is a God of the possible. That nothing is impossible with God. Now, as a priest of Israel, I mean, Zechariah should have known. I mean, he knew the Torah. He probably had a good chunk of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament memorized. And he would have known in that book of Genesis, the very first book, this, this story of this other childless couple who were old and yet blessed with a child. The Abraham and Sarah, they were well beyond childbearing years when God blessed them with a son. You know, it's ironic that Zechariah's name actually means God has remembered. But here we have, in the most critical moment of Zechariah's life, well, he has a hard time. A hard time remembering the God that he serves. But, but isn't that often true, right? Um, I mean, even myself, right? Sometimes I believe in the abstract, but I doubt in the particular, Right? I mean, we believe that God cares about all people, but we just question, does God care about me or us? We believe that God so loved the world that we could say that over and over again, but we struggle still to believe in our deepest part of our being that God loves me. We believe that God hears and answers prayers, yet we just wonder, is he really listening to us? But hope says remember. Remember what God has promised. Remember that God has been faithful in the past. Remember that nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible with God. And so hope says remember. And then Luke tells us this. He says, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. The time for doubting has passed. Hope has become a reality, and now it's time to celebrate. So with Elizabeth, she says this, the Lord has done this for me. He has shown his favor, and he has taken away my disgrace from among, among his people. And when this child is born, Zechariah regains his voice, and he sings the song of praise. And they name him John, which means God is gracious. And with the birth of this child, Elizabeth, she feels kind of the cloak of shame removed. A, a son, a son would carry on their family name. A son they would have that would be able to care for them in their old age. See, it was now time for them to celebrate God's graciousness. And isn't it just like God to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine? See, Zechariah and Elizabeth, well... They wanted a son, but they got a prophet. 
a man who Jesus would speak of in reference and say this, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John, John the Baptist. Elizabeth and Zechariah, their wait had been long. Their wait had been painful. But when hope was fulfilled, it was greater than anything they'd ever dreamed. Now, wouldn't it just be great if all stories ended just like this? But they don't, right? In fact, many, maybe I'd even say most don't. See, sometimes hope doesn't lead to the exact thing we're longing for. Sometimes it leads us to a completely different direction or space. And I've experienced it firsthand. I mean, there are things that I have hoped for and hoped for and prayed for that ended up being dead ends. There's things that I've prayed for for years that still haven't come to fruition. I still have so many of my friends that I've prayed for who are far from God. I still have so many of my friends and even family who are experiencing brokenness. And even certain things about my own story just haven't turned out on what I'd hoped for. So I know, I know what it feels like to be disappointed. But my guess is that you do too. But here's the thing. God's goodness isn't reserved for hope fulfilled. You see, God's goodness can also be found in our disappointments. God's graciousness can be found with us and through us and in us at every step of the journey. And I've experienced this firsthand too. His goodness has come to me through thoughtful people, through new opportunities, through important lessons learned that didn't line up with my hopes and dreams and expectations. But hope can help us see that every roadblock, everything we run into, it might not be the end. It might be a fresh turn to a new direction. You see, sometimes we can be so fixated on what hasn't happened that we miss out on all the goodness that God has for us on the journey along the way. You see, hope reminds us to trust, to trust in God's goodness. When we're facing our disappointments, perhaps we just need to step back and ask ourselves this. What can I learn from this? How can I enjoy life even though I don't currently have what I want? And where do I see God's goodness right here in the middle of my disappointment? Regardless of whether or not God gives us exactly what we want, we believe that God will give us what we need. Sometimes it will be the answering of our prayers just like we asked. But sometimes it will be more than we could imagine. And even while the answer isn't what we wanted or expected, we, you and I, we can trust that God has good things for us to experience. Because hope says trust. Trust in the goodness of God. Now the hope, the hope of a Christ follower, it is not blind optimism. It is not pretense. No, no, our hope is rooted in a historical occurrence that happened over 2,000 years ago in this little town called Bethlehem. In this town, another child was born, the Savior of the world. And he came so that you and I, we could find our way back to God so that we could live with the hope that one day, one day there would be no more pain, no unmet longing, no more disappointment. So what is? What is it that keeps us going one day to the next? What gives us the ability to fight our way through periods of discouragement or depression? What makes us believe that one day will be better than the next? It's a four-letter word that has enormous power, enormous power to turn our success into power, to turn our strength from weakness. And the word is hope. See, hope says wait. Hope says remember. And hope says trust. As the Christmas carol so beautifully recalls, the hopes and fears of all the years 
are met in thee tonight. Jesus is our hope. He is the hope of the world. And my friends, that hope is for everyone. Now I want to close with this. We want to give you a tangible reminder of this hope. This hope that we have in Jesus. So here's what we want to give you. It's just this simple wooden ornament that has the word hope on it. But we would like for every one of you to get one of these. So here's what I need you to do. Right now, go ahead, get your smartphone out, and I want you to text the word hope to the phone number that's on the screen. Text the word hope, okay, that's 816-608-4767. If you text the word hope to that number, you can fill out a little form, send it on in, and we're going to drop one of these in the mail for you this week so that you can have it. You can put it on your Christmas tree, you can hang it on your mirror of your car, you can put it somewhere just to remind you that there's hope. The hope comes from Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful, so grateful that God, you saw us as people in need of a Savior. You saw us as people who were full of disappointment. God, you saw us in people that sometimes were missing out on hope. And God, that when you saw us is that that's when you set your son Jesus that we celebrate this Christmas time, the incarnation, the arrival of Jesus to earth. God, we are so grateful for that. God, we are so grateful that we can experience the very presence of Jesus during this holiday season, during this Christmas season, that can change us, that can change others, and that can change our life in eternity. Thank you, Father, for loving us and being present with us and for giving us a hope, a hope that can endure. We pray this in Jesus' name.